Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, October 24th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Berlin, Germany. And if you happen to be in Berlin as well this week, Thursday evening, I'll be giving a presentation here about the Internet Storm Center and how we track some of the Internet of Things exploits. Just uh, drop me a note if you're interested in attending. You can use uh, the Internet Storm Center's contact page or just drop me an email. Today we got a guest diary by Alan Tu. He's writing about SOX proxies. First of all, he lists a couple of sites that list SOX proxies that may be interesting intelligence in order to figure out where some of the attacks that you are seeing coming from. And he also made some interesting observations how these proxies appear to be focusing on a couple different networks that apparently, which appear to attract a particular large amount of these types of services. And a common problem for networks these days is the ever-increasing amount of encrypted traffic. Now, this isn't always a security issue necessarily. Encryption does help protect the privacy of traffic and does protect the integrity in many cases. But if you're trying to inspect traffic for data exfiltration, or if you're trying to uncover malware command control channels, it's often quite useful to be able to gain some information about what traffic is exchanged and in particular, what sites people connect to. Now, my usual recommendation is that you take a close look at DNS traffic, but uh, this may no longer really be an option. There is an increasing effort to encrypt DNS traffic. We have DNSSEC, but DNSSEC really only deals with the authenticity and integrity of DNS messages. It doesn't encrypt them. The one standard that's gaining a little bit steam here is DNS over TLS. And it looks like Android is now adding this to its implementation of DNS. There have been some recent commits to the Android code base that a couple of Android blogs noticed that do implement DNS over TLS. DNS over TLS will use TCP over port 853, so will be relatively easy to spot. And of course, the receiving DNS server will have to support it. There are quite a few concerns right now about the additional overhead that this protocol does require. It's not a fully ratified standard at this point, just a proposed standard. Nevertheless, there are server implementations and maybe with Android soon, a very popular client-side implementation of this protocol. However, DNS over TLS isn't the end of all of your privacy concerns. You would still connect to some kind of recursive DNS server. DNS over TLS actually kind of requires that you maintain a connection with that DNS server in order to not incur the overhead of setting up a new TCP and TLS connection for each query. So that recursive DNS server that you're connecting to will still, still receive copies of all of your DNS queries and could potentially intercept and log them. So we'll see how Antron implements this and if it will take off as a result. At this point, it looks like I think that Android will be the first and only major operating system offering this option. And ESET is reporting that it is spotting more fake cryptocurrency trading applications that are published in the Google Play Store. The one they're pointing out here does impersonate the Polonix uh, cryptocurrency exchange. It uses that particular name as its developer name and essentially tries to look like a legitimate application that you could use in order to manage your Polonix account. Well, uh, all the application really does is steal your credentials in order to allow an attacker to then later come in and rate your account. 
I guess if you're looking for a mobile application or any application to manage a Bitcoin account or a real bank account for that matter, you probably should look for respective links on the website for your bank or Bitcoin exchange. And you may remember last year NIST came out with recommendations that suggested that SMS messages should no longer be used for two-factor authentication. And Google is apparently trying to push more and more users to use its one-touch app as a second factor and it attempts to move away from SMS. Now, last year, NIST, of course, recommended that SMS should no longer be used for two-factor authentication. And with that, we see more and more use of apps like this. This is actually not the one-time password, a Google Authenticator, but instead an application that essentially just presents a pop-up message on your mobile device asking you to approve a login without having to enter an additional code. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.